So welcome to all of you who are joining us now, whether you're joining us here live or viewing this later as a recording, we are so happy to have you with us. My name is Naomi Hoffer and I'm the program manager for the UCSF Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program, whose mission is to support the wellness and quality of life of our patients and caregivers who are dealing with brain cancer. Today we are addressing a difficult subject for many of us, but such an important one for all of us. Our topic of living well, dying well is pretty huge and all encompassing, but um, we're hoping to approach it in a way that might leave us with perhaps some new ideas that can support us in our future conversations and decisions, as well as allow us to live more fully in the here and now. I want to acknowledge your courage for showing up today and um, joining us and um, others here online as we address this topic head on. So we're going to start by jumping right into the topic of death and seeing what it might feel like to approach it from a heart centered place. We will then look at it from a physical, emotional, psychological and spiritual perspective and learn about resources that might be helpful to us through our own process. We will end with a discussion of how we can use the lens of death to allow us to live more fully now. We hope to have some time for your questions and please submit those using the Q&A function on your screen. And finally, for those of you who wish to continue the discussion with each other and deepen the experience through an interactive activity, we invite you to stay on for our unrecorded after the show segment where we will do just that. I'll let you know how to do that at the end of the presentation. So now it is my absolute honor to introduce our featured speaker here with us today. For death doula, yoga teacher, health coach, and Reiki master, Anthea Grimison, meeting and supporting like-minded souls that seek meaning at any stage of life is her greatest joy. For the past 15 years, Anthea has studied and worked in the fields of yoga and health as a way to transform her own life and to be of service to others. Her work has since evolved to focus on end of life, and she aspires to create safe spaces to explore life, death, and grief, highly motivated to address the silence, fear, and stigma around death in our society. Anthea believes in living in and appreciating the here and now, for it is all we have, this breath, this moment. Originally from Ireland, Anthea is currently based in Mill Valley. She lives to serve others while continuing to learn in the University of Life and to enjoy and share the beautiful gifts of this place, Earth, that we all call home. Anthea, thank you so much for being with us here today and helping us safely explore and better understand this phase of our lives. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Naomi and Mary, for inviting me and hi to everyone out out there watching. It's uh, you know a real privilege to be talking to you all today and I look forward to connecting with some of you afterwards. You know as a end of life doula I get the immense privilege to be in the presence of, of death and invited into that space and it really is a privilege. So I want to share with you some of those experiences but also to explore the different aspects of dying that you may be thinking about or have questions about anything from the physical to the emotional to the spiritual aspects. And just to say that I'm definitely not here as an expert telling you what you should do, as this is absolutely your own journey. It's a very personal journey, as is life. And also that it's a huge topic, so we'll only really get to scratch the surface, but hopefully it can offer some things to consider when you're contemplating your end of life. So simply just take what resonates with you and what is relevant to your situation. And, you know, for only you know what really matters to you as well. And a little about the end of life doula role. As doulas, we, we're companions to people who are dying and grieving. So we help at all stages. We help plan, we listen deeply, we advocate for our clients, we honor their wishes we sit by bedsides, we hold hands through the dying process, and we hold, basically hold space for the whole process and for the loved ones around. We explain what's happening, we provide grief support, and we educate about death care. Clients that I, that I work with are, I would consider really my teachers though. I learn so much from them and obviously as well, other doulas I collaborate with, 
and we collaborate a lot with palliative care and hospice providers too. And ultimately death itself is such a great teacher. My own earliest lesson about death was when my mother died just after my second birthday. So I guess it's really been present my whole life, something I've contemplated my whole life. And there was a lot of silence around her death. It was, you know, it was obviously a tragedy. She was 37. She had three young children. And it was so painful for so many people. And they did not, looking back, I know they didn't have the tools to deal with the loss or even talk about it. And I guess it's a cultural thing as well, where it's quite the Irish thing to pick yourself up and get on with things. So there wasn't much conversation. And I, I really miss that. And, you know, but at the same time, this experience ended up being a gift for me and understanding from a very, very early age about the presence of death and how we just don't know our timeline in this life and therefore to treat life as a gift and see how time is precious and ultimately leading me to this work. You know, I guess in my career, I focused for so many years on health and wellness and I, I still do, but I kept thinking about this fact that our trajectory in life is not to keep getting healthier and get getting well, that, that ultimately at some point we're all gonna experience illness and disease and that we're all gonna die, but you know, nobody's really talking about that. It conflicted with the messaging out there about health and anti-aging and um, nobody was talking about the truth that illness and death are just a most natural part of human life. So we're very much a death denying culture. And so that leads to today where I'm very motivated to talk, talk about the hard things like death as I believe we can all do better to support each other and that it really helps when we connect around these human experiences. It can motivate us to live our best lives now. And, you know, talking about it does not bring it any closer but, you know, it does just to recognize that it does take courage to turn towards this tender topic. So I really respect and honor your courage by showing up here today. And please take care of yourselves through this conversation and definitely just take a break if you need to. So moving on. So why the big bad D word? Why are we so afraid of death? Why is it so hard to talk about? You know, the word death conjures up these dark, scary images and death in the media and in movies is always this dramatically tragic and event and to be feared and avoided. And, you know, a lot of it can also be just fear of the unknown. Maybe we haven't had much death in our own lives or maybe we had a bad experience or we only just heard about it from a distance and we weren't involved in anyone's death. So there are many reasons and, you know, sadly also care providers can sometimes avoid using really direct language around the fact that someone is dying as they, they don't want to destroy hope. So there's this general avoidance and, um, you know, it's, it's seen as something dark over there. But what I want to bring to light is that the dying experience is so much more than that. And, you know, what about what about all the love and care that shows up when someone's dying? It brings people closer. And um, the fact that it's just a natural human process, like all living beings. What about the rituals and spiritual aspects? Honoring people and celebrating their lives, not just looking at the end of life, but looking at someone's whole life. So, you know, not talking openly about death rejects all these parts. And while talking openly can bring relief in a lot of cases and lifting a burden of, you know, something you felt you had to be silent about, but you kind of knew about it anyway, or, you know, want to talk about it, but didn't know how. Um, and it can bring about closeness with, you know, your care providers and ultimately acceptance as well. So I feel it's very healthy and I want us to embrace all these parts of death and dying. But before we dive in further, um, I'd like to invite us all to take a moment to just ground and drop in. We'll do just a short meditation. Um, this is really a journey through the heart, which is really where we connect deeply to each other and our shared human experiences. So I invite you all to get comfortable in your seat and just take a moment to ground and drop in. So closing your eyes, 
And just feeling to start with the support underneath you of your seat or your couch, your bed, wherever you are. Dropping into that place, feel your sit bones dropping down. Feel the support of the ground underneath your feet. Notice your shoulders and notice if there's if they're feeling tense and just allow them to drop down. And then focusing for a moment on your mouth and jaw area again, just checking for any tension around this area and allowing it to fully relax. Allowing all the small muscles around your eyes to feel soft and relaxed. And allowing your belly to be soft. Then just bringing your focus to your heart space. And noticing the breath. without making any additional effort, just simply noticing how the breath flows in and out, keeping us alive without any effort. Soft, natural movements. And if you like, and if it feels comfortable to you, you can place a hand on your heart just to bring your attention to the space. So we want to come out of our minds and down to the heart area. Just notice, first of all, how you're feeling. And this hand on the heart actually sends a signal to your brain that you're safe. Really simple, beautiful practice you can do at any time. Now imagine that you're breathing through your heart space, that the breath is actually going in and out through that center point. Feel the space warming up and expanding out beyond the confines of your body. Expanding out even further And how this is the space where we all connect with each other through the heart. This tender place inside of us that also extends beyond. this work of turning towards difficult topics like death and dying is really work of the heart. So we wanna really tune into this space. Good, then bringing your awareness back to your body and to your breath. Maybe taking a few deeper breaths. 
again, feeling the support beneath you, wherever you're sitting or lying. And when you're ready, you can bring your hand down and open your eyes. Thank you for joining me on that. I, I can't see you, but I already feel more connected to all of you out there through that. So we can, we can connect with each other through this amazing technology, but certainly through the heart. So let's dive in a little bit now to explore some of the aspects to consider in preparing for end of life. So I want to start with the physical aspects around the body. So thinking about, you know, what's ahead of me and, you know, what does death look like? What are the options to consider for my body? And where will I be? Where will I physically be? And again, you know, I'm not necessarily here giving answers. In fact, I may raise more questions for you, but I do want to just help name some of maybe the things you're thinking about, some concerns and things to explore further, maybe talk to your care providers about. So looking at, you know, people often wonder, well, how, what's this going to look like for my body? How will my body change and what's going to happen? You know, what will it do? And, and the point, main point here is that, you know, dying is the most natural process in the world, just like birth was, and that the body really knows what to do, just like how our breath knows what to do to keep us alive. The body knows what to do when it comes to dying and that it's the most natural process that, you know, so we often have this concept that dying is a medical process and it's really not, and, or that it's something to be fixed or something bad or wrong. And, you know, really it's not. The body really does know what to do. So it's tuning into that and trusting, trusting the process. Another concern can be, you know, fear of suffering um, or loss of control, managing pain. Am I going to be, am I going to be in pain? Um, how do I control that? So these are some of the very, very common fears, especially if you don't know what to expect. So, you know, and some of the ways to address that are with through whether it's palliative care or at the end of life hospice, which is the part of palliative care for end of life. So in palliative care provides all sorts of support for relieving suffering. It's um, a very holistic care at any stage of illness. And so it's definitely worth something considering, worth considering. And um, many people don't know that they can access it. And really, it's about quality of life. And so it's not something you have to necessarily stay on forever. But it's definitely worth when you have a diagnosis to to talk about and to, to see if it's something for you. Hospice care then is the part of palliative care for end of life. So both of these are providing comfort and relieving suffering through symptom management, but also not just the physical pain, also through spiritual processing and practical planning. So you get access to doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, volunteers, and many more practitioners. So that's just something worth considering if that's one of your fears is like, well, what about the pain? And it, it, it is literally the job of hospice, especially if, you know, dying at home is something that's important to you. And they come to your home, they come to you and provide whatever care is needed to help relieve some of the suffering. Then there's the, also to consider is whether the pain is physical or is it emotional or spiritual? And we'll come to that a little bit later. Then the other, you know, question that, you know, people often wonder about, well, what does death actually look like? You know, and, and maybe you just have this idea from movies or maybe you've seen one or several loved ones die. You know, we all have different experiences. And, you know, it's important to note that there is no one way to die. There are very uh, clear changes and normal signs of someone being in a more active dying phase at the end of life. Most people don't show all of them, but a lot of people show some of them. So things like changes in circulation, 
um, as the heart slows down. So that changes skin color, lip color, temperature, changes in breathing as the lungs slow down, um, longer pauses, rattling sounds. Then there can also be things like agitation. Um, sometimes people are reaching out and looking up um, talking about going home. So these are really common and normal things that can be seen at the end of life. Uh, I had one client recently who was on hospice care at home and he had a very short diagnosis, but he, he didn't want, when he was on hospice care, the one thing he did not want was his morphine that you know was there available to him. Um, he had round the clock caregivers, he had loved ones all around him, but he just did not want the morphine, even though he was kind of struggling a little bit and in a little bit of pain. But his, what was important for him, he was so curious about the death experience that he wanted to be really present. So um, we did Reiki on him um, and, and just witnessed that sometimes he was in awe and saying like, wow, and other times he was struggling a little bit and coughing, and, and but he wanted to be present. That was what was super important to him. For other people, they want all the morphine, all the pain management. They just, you know, want to make sure there is absolutely no suffering. So everybody's different and um, it's a very personal process. So definitely options to consider are um, palliative care when you have a diagnosis of a serious illness um, and talking to your care provider about particular concerns for your own diagnosis. So you know, with brain cancer, there might be certain symptoms that you're afraid of or you're already experienced, um, you know, related to the tumor. And that also will be different for everyone. And so talking to your provider about what some of the upcoming, you know, concerns are. And then also considering things like how much intervention do you want? Um, so we'll come to the planning part a little bit later, but things like feeding tubes, things like respirators, or purely just comfort care. Um, voluntary stopping eating and drinking is one option for people who want a little bit more control over, um, you know, when they die. And so that's where no all liquids and food are stopped. And it is along with palliative sedation. So there is uh, comfort care there as well. And over time, the organs shut down and the person will pass away. And um, then there's also medical aid in dying. So the End of Life Options Act in California, um, where there is a medical concoction that someone can take if they qualify, if they're already within the last six months of their life. And they can mentally make the decision to, to uh, decide that they want to use this and also that they are physically able to take the drink themselves or push the, push the plunger when it's taken rectally. So as a doula, we actually support people through both these processes. So there's just different options to get information about and understand and have knowledge about. Um, and then finally, you know, the, one of the things to really think about, and you know, again, this is so personal, is where will I physically be? Like what? Do I want to die at home? Will I be in hospital? You know, what are the options there? What do I want to happen to my body? And, um, you know, the, you see these stats out there that 80% of Americans would prefer to die at home, yet only 20% die at home, you know, and they may be old stats at this point, but um, it's just worth considering if you have strong preference. And maybe you don't, maybe actually you're absolutely fine with being in hospital knowing that you'll get all the care you need there. Other people are like, I absolutely want to be at home or I don't want to be at home. I don't want to burden my family. Um, there are also comfort care homes for people who don't have the care around them to be able to die at home, which are essentially homes for the dying and hospice facilities. And what I'd say here is that from what I've seen is that peaceful deaths can happen anywhere. Um, so, you know, I think some people do have a strong preference about location. Um, and I totally understand that too. I would prefer to die at home than in a hospital. And, you know, some people don't. So it's really up to you. I did, I was supporting a lady who was dying in a pretty, 
rough facility, I would say, and had a very, very tough time leading up to her death. She had experienced homelessness. She had family drama. She had a lot of turmoil in her life. She had addictions and, you know, her life was just very, very dramatic and crazy and very sad. And I actually walked in to visit her in this facility, which was, you know, beds packed into this room. And as I walked in, she started to die. And it was one of the most gentle, peaceful deaths I've ever witnessed. And just seeing that peace wash over her and seeing her gently slip away was really comforting. And so the life story doesn't necessarily predict the death story. And it was very comforting just to know that really peaceful deaths can happen anywhere. So moving on then to some of the emotional aspects. I mean, obviously this is a really, really emotional topic. Um, I love this quote of the work is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and to be stretched large by them. And, you know, really that is the challenge of this, this tricky life, right? It's like, there's always going to be grief and loss and losses along the way of this journey. And how can we tune into the gratitude as well? So thinking about things like how, how do I feel now about this? Like what comes up for me when I contemplate end of life and how will I feel when I'm closer? And, and, you know, it is a journey and for sure feelings will change along the way. So just to check in in yourself and, um, you know, know that like emotions are normal and that they're often information. It's so, you know, when strong emotions come up, they're guideposts, actually, they're data to, to showing us what's important. It's like, oh, I should look at that, you know. And I feel as well, you know, sometimes when I work with mainly cancer patients and it's like sometimes their voice can get a little bit lost amidst the kind of all the action going around and all the people involved in the process and, and um, multiple different people with different emotions going on. So um, it's about finding your own voice and not getting lost amidst the noise, you know, and that it's normal to experience both fear and joy love and anger and that we can hold all of those as humans we've got this capacity to hold so many emotions at once and um you know the 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 loss along the way brings up a lot of grief and it's going to continually come up right letting go of the old you letting go of the way things used to be and that's a continual journey and that you know that brings us a little bit into the past and then fear of the future fear of dying can bring us a bit into the future into future and so it's like how can I work to bring myself back to center through you know whether it's through breath through meditation through being in nature um looking at loved ones as well like worrying about how they will cope and the fact that our loved ones are often experiencing our loved ones people dying are often experiencing anticipatory grief where it's very, very real grief before the event has happened. And so it's just acknowledging that, you know, when someone's dying, there's their own journey and then there's all the people around them. And often like everybody is on a completely different journey around this and going through their own emotions and their own fears and their own grief. And so it's kind of a balance about, you know, having compassion for others, but making sure to take care of yourself too and you know opening up the conversation but also having boundaries and it's common to hear people say that you know I feel like I have to take care of my loved ones they're the ones with you know with the disease and dealing with you know what's coming up and so it's sometimes it is about creating boundaries and um and and, and checking in with what's important what's important for you so I had one lady that I worked with a couple of years ago who's she she was dying she was only in her 50s and she had a 12 year old son and you know all her loved ones were getting really frustrated and her doctor was getting really frustrated because she would not go in hospice but she was clearly getting closer to the end 
and would not get to a place of acceptance. But when I spoke to her and really checked in with what was important to her, I understood that she had to fight till her last minute for, you know, for the sake of her son. That's what was most important to her. She knew she did accept and she, I think she went on hospice like the day before she died, but that was the most important thing for her. So sometimes, you know, and I, I tried to kind of coach some of her loved ones around that. It's like, you know, we got to meet her where she's at and, and be with her with that and, and bring some understanding to that. So thinking about how do, well, how do I hold all of this, you know, and it comes back to that we don't hopefully have to do this alone, that, you know, to bring in your circles of care, to use a support team to get the additional support that you need, whether medical or non-medical. Um, so thinking about just like, what are your circles of care? Like how, who is in your close circle, who are in the wider circles? And sometimes as well, because it can feel overwhelming and it can feel too much and like too, pe too many people involved, sometimes having like um, a gatekeeper, you know, or someone is your companion, whether it's a doula or a friend or, and they're kind of the ones communicating with everybody else so that you don't have to, hold everybody else's journey as well. And then asking for more support if needed, resting if needed, silence if needed, not speaking, not taking care of others. And also that it's it's really okay not to be okay. Um, you know, if I think about, I have a dear friend back in Ireland at the moment whose 16 year old daughter has a brain tumor and has been going through treatment on and off for the past four years. and. You know, I just think about her parents and are they ever going to be ready to, to see their daughter going through more treatments and, you know, not being able to just be a teenager and they're not, but they don't have any choice, you know? So it's like, it's also okay just to, to not be okay sometimes. And we can only do, you know, use the tools that we have in the moment. Sometimes denial is all we have and that's all we have to cope. So getting to a place of acceptance is really about um, completion and thinking about, well, what matters most to you? And where am I now? Where am I now in this new version of me that may not be the old me? And it's not quite end of life me, but where am I now? Like contemplating the meaning of your life. Is there any unfinished business? Is there anything left unsaid or unresolved? I like this idea of um, the degree of resistance is equal to the degree of suffering. So it's when we're resisting what is, that's often where the, the suffering and struggle is. And how can we over time just gently looking and turning towards just what is and trying to let go of some of that resistance. There's a quote by Francis Weller from his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, that I really like, where he says, I'm not suggesting that we live a life preoccupied with sorrow. I am saying that our refusal to welcome the sorrows that come to us, our inability to move through these experiences with true presence and conscious awareness, condemns us to a life shadowed by grief. Welcoming everything that comes to us is the challenge. This is the secret to being fully alive. So I just wanted to take a little breath and come back to the heart again. I'm going through a lot of things pretty fast and just take a little pause again. Close your eyes and if it feels comfortable to place your hand on your heart. And just take a few nice deep breaths here. Great, so moving on then to the more mental aspects or some of the practical aspects, like there can be, you know, what do I need to actually do and contemplating, you know, psychological aspects. What does death mean? What is good death? What is a bad death? And um, what planning do I have to do? 
what do I want and who are all the different roles and what is the paperwork I have to do? Because there's a lot, it can seem like a big project ahead of us. So first of all, I just wanted to say that I don't like the term bad death. It's not a good or a bad thing. These are just labels. Um, achieving a good death is, it's not something else, that w another thing we need to put on our to-do list, right? That, oh, now I've got to achieve this. I've got to do this well. I've got to do this right. There is no right or wrong way. And, you know, we can't really control how we're all going to go. And we're, we're messy as humans, we're really messy and life can be messy as can death, you know? And that doesn't mean that there can't be beauty and healing and, you know, opportunity for learning along the way. It's just taking away the pressure to, oh, I've got to do it this particular way. I've got to do all these things and make sure everything is right. And, you know, it's like, don't worry about that. It's, you know, do as much planning as you can. We all should be doing our planning, but then also to let it go. So some of these things that I'm talking about are, you know, if you could choose and, you know, do you know what your wishes are? So end of life planning is actually really important. If you haven't looked at this yet, then I really encourage you to do that. So um, there's things like legacy projects, which is doulas, we work with people a lot with these, you know, so how do you want remembered? Is this something you want to leave behind, whether it's letters, recordings, art, um, all sorts of things creating a vigil plan for your final days. So for people who do want to die at home, like how do you want that to look and feel? Are there any rituals that are important to you? What music do you want? Which loved ones would you love there? Do you like touch? Do you like certain smells? You know, so it can be a very personal creative process. Um, and I, I love being an advocate for people in, you know, in getting the, their wishes honored at the end of life and, and creating those spaces for them for them to be. Then there's all the options for for after death. There's um you know do you, home funerals, green burials, cremation, memorial trees, there's now water cremation. Um, do you want a memorial, celebration of life? Do you have strong issues? So it's really about asking yourself, you know, again, what's important to me? And maybe none of this is important, or maybe you have a lot of wishes. And if you do, I would get them down. Um, I recently had a client who, for him, he wanted Hawaiian sounds and pictures of water. So his friend set up his room with just constant sounds of, you know, the tropics playing in the background and pictures of the ocean everywhere. He was also very spiritual. And so I sat with him meditating and chanting even after he died and also at his cremation um you know and his friends put the the flower garlands on his coffin and so you know people it's wonderful to see it because it's 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 your it's your life it's your death so if you could plan what would you like it to be like and knowing that it may may not be able it may not happen but you know it's good to for your loved ones to get your wishes down so then just talking about some of the roles that we mentioned before, the roles of, you know, it takes a village and who are the different people. Um, so we've got, I mentioned palliative care, always worth looking at for additional holistic support and available at any stage. Then there's hospice for end of life. Um, if someone wants to die at home, then hospice is not going to be enough support because they will be in and out visiting, but around the clock, that person will need caregivers, whether it's family or friends or hired help, um, you know, and probably a schedule setting up, you know, who's gonna do what shifts people are going to do. So I've seen people bring groups of friends together, um, hiring caregivers, if you can afford them through a 24, you know, agency. Um, end of life doulas can fill in the gaps and guide the process and you know pull the team together and also give respite to loved ones while helping the dying person find their voice in it all and and honoring their wishes you've got holistic practitioners reiki acupuncture sound healing music therapy 
There's the threshold choir that sing by the bedside of people dying. Um, all the friends and family and any other companions and advocates. So it really does take a village for people who want to, to die at home. So thinking ahead of like what's possible, what's affordable, what's available to me. Um, and then once you've kind of explored some of those wishes, it's getting them down onto on paper. So you've got a few different forms and we'll add these in the resources at the end. We've got the pulsed form, which is the physician orders for life sustaining treatment. Here you put in your goals for care and your treatment wishes. So what types of intervention you'd want or not want. You've got your advanced directives where you name your medical power of attorney and your wishes. Things like if you want access to medical aid in dying or, or voluntary stopping eating and drinking. Um, your will and estate planning. And one thing I use for going through this process is Go Wish cards. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's um, a card game that you can play to figure out and get clearer on what your own wishes are. And then talking about them with your loved ones. So it really is in a way a gift to your loved ones as it gives them a chance to, to really know what to do, but then also to honor them for you. And most people want to help, you know, and also you deserve to have your wishes honored. And yeah, you know, I just thinking of a client that I worked with a while back who is living with stage four breast cancer and she kept being given advanced directives and sent them and emailed them and everything. So many people had handed them to her and given her and she just was so blocked, did not want to look at them. And so we, we played that um, Go Wish card game and, and uh, it, was, it was really useful and, and just guided her a little bit on the process. and. You know, sometimes it just feels overwhelming. And so you can go to like sit down with someone and explore what's what your wishes are. Good. So moving on to spiritual aspects of dying. So so again, so much to delve into here. <laughs> I hope um, you know, there's the puzzle of time and how much time do we all have can really be a big part of spiritual processing, like this puzzle of figuring out what is life about and how how long are we here for and why um and maybe you know sometimes with a, a serious illness in some ways you've been given insight into what will likely cause your death and perhaps some idea of time but ultimately we don't know so it takes a lot of trust and surrender to be able to rest into this great mystery of it all to rest into the into the unknown um so and then there's um going beyond the body so you know thinking about who you are this is the big spiritual quest like who am i what what is this all about you know we know that we're not our thoughts we know that we're not our emotions these are temporary um you know that you're not your cancer and although I imagine and I hear from people that sometimes we're treated as if, you know, that is all you are, right? So it's like delving underneath all of that, like the self can get a bit lost and, you know, what is self? Where and what does this all mean? And where can I still find connection to that which is greater than us? What brings you joy? What brings you wonder and beauty? Um, this heart connection to others is is often strongest at the time of death. And so I see this where the barriers drop away. And I think that's one of the reasons I love working with people end of life because everything is just so real and, and also wondrous. And, um, you know, nature, being in nature can be one way to, to experience that connection or meditation, breath work. So thinking about what are the ways we can go beyond our minds and our ego to connect to that greater mystery. Then we have personal values and beliefs. So thinking about where do we go? What happens when you die? Do you have a particular faith or religion? Are you, do you feel connected to spirit and, and to ancestors? What resonates for you? And have your beliefs changed through this process? Um, some philosophies view life and death as part of 
a cycle where death is not seen as the end, but a gateway to the next phase of life. Um, the continuous cycle of birth, life, death and rebirth. Um, others talk about death being part of natural law, the way of following nature. Others believe in an afterlife and that life is a divine gift from God. Um, in some communities, it's, you know, it's the dead remain very present and active in the lives of the living. And then some other philosophies have held death to be a final point, final endpoint. So, you know, it's about exploring some of these topics for yourself and discovering meaning yourself. What resonates with me? You know, how do I feel that we we live on? How can death be a teacher for me? Um, ultimately, we don't know we're all beginners at this. Um, but, you know, I feel like, and I see people as they get closer to death. I had one dear friend who died a few years ago, and I really witnessed her wisdom emerging through her dying process. And she, she was only 38 years old and really came to a place of acceptance that like taught all of us that were involved, you know, so, you know, that about what was important and how, and how she, her message that she wanted to share was about kindness, but also about acceptance and how death is not to be feared and it's just a natural part of life and that we should embrace it. So I personally feel con very connected to her doing this work also to my own mother and grandmother. And so, you know, it's worth exploring for yourselves as well. Do you feel any connection to people who've passed in your life to spirit or to ancestors? And maybe that's far too woo for you and doesn't resonate at all. So again, it's really, really personal. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about perspective because this can also be helpful. Um, this idea of zooming out and zooming in. So, you know, the when fear takes over thinking about death, it's often because we're in our own kind of minds and egos and it can be really helpful to zoom out to the wider world and think about the fact that, oh, we're all living and dying, just like all living things, you know? And also that we're all connected, like none of us, well, none of us are islands and we're connected in a really, in a very real way. And this gives life meaning. Um, and that the fact that we're all, I'll often say to clients, you know, we're all heading in the same direction. I'm going there too. I'm, you're just a little bit ahead of me, you know? It's like, you're just a little bit ahead of the line, but I, I'm, we're all that going that way too. So we'll, we'll be after you, you know? Um, and other global kind of in aspects such as the environment and the fact that death makes life possible. It's, it is this continuous cycle every day, so many people being born every day, so many people dying that, you know, without death, every birth would be a tragedy. Like we wouldn't be able to fit in the world. And so we need death, we need this cycle of nature. So that can just be helpful to kind of contemplate, to zoom out of your own world and connect to the, the greater world when, when fear sets in and you're feeling alone. But then it's also important to honor the personal journey and turn towards your own life, like I've been mentioning and, you know, contemplate the things about what does my life mean? You know, is there, am I still dealing with grief from not wanting to accept where I am? And that's okay. And how do how do I just sit with that gently? Are there things that I want to heal to let go of? Are there people I want to forgive? Are there areas in my life that I'm feeling stuck in or sad about? And what are the things that are likely to come up for me when end of life is a little closer? And often they are the, you know, the the regrets, the words not said, things like that. Um so really looking at your own process and how you can come to a place of acceptance of what is not allowing the fears of the future or the grief of the past to pull you too much from the present, knowing that really, you know, this is all we have, this right here, right now. And so we're all just working with exactly what we have. And, you know, like I mentioned, it's, it's messy, but it's perfect the way it is. So, 
yeah and then just to to plan but also to surrender to let go you know we're traveling to an unknown destination and so you can pack your bags all right but just being open to the experience and being curious and knowing that it can be a creative process you know um, and coming to a place of trust that we're already all doing the hard work of living <laughs> um, so just trusting in that trusting in life and that we have the wisdom we have the skills and trusting in death so yeah when you're feeling overwhelmed by it all can be helpful to zoom in again to into your heart to care for yourself check how you are and and be with yourself and see what you need so there is a list of resources here i won't go through them all and um, just to say that my email and website is on there as well. There's so many resources I could add, books and podcasts and websites and everything, but there's really good UCSF resources and advanced care planning workshops. And so I'd really encourage you all to attend those and explore those if you haven't already. And I just put, you know, a couple of other resources there, but I'm available if anybody has particular resources that you're looking for, you can definitely pop me an email. So I wanted to come back to this concept of, you know, living your best life, knowing, knowing that we're all going to die. And, you know, I love this, this Snoopy one, you know, we only live when Snoopy and wrong, we only die once we live every day, right? So every day that we wake up, we've got today. And, um, tomorrow if we wake up we've got that day you know so just focusing in on the present and what can we do with today Frank Astaseski a beautiful end of life and Buddhist teacher here in the Bay Area talks about how embracing the truth that all things inevitably, inevitably must end encourages us not to wait in order to begin living each moment in a manner that is deeply engaged we stop wasting our lives on meaningless activities we learn to not hold our opinions, our desires, and even our own identity so tightly. Instead of pinning our hopes on a better future, we focus on the present and being grateful for what we have in front of us right now. So it's just looking at, at the truth of death and allowing it to teach us about the magic of life, that how this is all temporary and that all things change and we all must leave here and transition to whatever is next. But there's beauty in that and it can help us to, to not waste time and to be grateful and, and compassionate for others as well and everyone's journey. So, yeah, it's death can be a healing opportunity, a learning opportunity uh, each step of the way and starting from right now. So it's not I don't feel like it's morbid to turn towards death and to look up at it and think about it. In fact, it can help us bring healing to where we are right now. And, you know, what does healing mean? Healing can be things like facing fears, um, understanding and embracing the fact that death and disease are normal parts of life and feeling free to express fully who we are. There can be, there can be great freedom in that. And when we face our fear of death, we realize we don't need to fear life. So it, it can bring us immense freedom. And I remember it was about 10 years ago when I was about to leave Ireland. I just left my corporate job and I was heading off to Asia to go and study and practice yoga. And but I had this immense fear that was kind of a little bit overwhelming. And so I was just worried that I was making a silly decision and, you know, was it the right thing to do. And I was finding it hard to let go of the security. And so I went up to. Um, the crematorium where both my mother and grandmother's ashes are there's a tree and um, I remember putting my hands in the tree and just feeling this instant kind of knowing that they would be with me but then I also went you know into the main building and there's this big beautiful book that has all the names and, and dates and so I was just looking at my mother's death date and it occurred to me in that very moment that if I was her right then, that I would have a year and a half left to live. And 
instantly in that moment because I was like well what if that's true what if I only have a year and a half left to live or less like we don't know then then I have absolutely nothing to be afraid of and so you know it's sometimes we hold ourselves back by fear and contemplating end of life for me has been personally very freeing in well I don't know and I have to embrace the now you know and this is all that we've got um I know there's a year to live program at Spirit Rock and based on Stephen's Levine, Stephen Levine's book that could be worth exploring. But um, we also will explore this a little bit more in the meditation afterwards. But first, I do want to give time to some comments, some questions. And I know we've gone, I've glossed over a lot of things here this evening. So before we move to that, I just want to close again by coming back to our hearts so thank you all for listening and if we can just go to the final slide there and we will tune into our hearts again and focus for a moment on gratitude which is very timely being the holidays so inviting you once again to just close your eyes and tune into your heart space. Offering thanks to all of you who showed up tonight and who are watching online for having the courage to turn towards the hard things, the tender things. And then silently in your own mind, just offering out as many thank yous as you want to all that you're grateful for in your life at this moment. Thinking about all the love, the people, thinking about the earth and nature or a delicious meal, a cup of coffee, sound of a bird, whatever it is, all the small things and all the big things, it's really feeling that in your heart. Nice, then taking a nice breath. Thank you all very much. So now I believe we are going to open up to some comments or questions. Yes, thank you so much, Anthea. That was really um, just so lovely, the way you helped us unfold and, and bring this discussion really into our hearts. So I really appreciate it. Um, so we do have a few questions. For those of you who, who would like to submit questions, please do so using the Q&A function. Um, there was a question that came in. Um, this might be before you addressed it, because I know you did address it a little bit, but does death hurt? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the biggest fears, isn't it? And um, so I spoke a little bit about, yeah, that, you know, pain management. How do we, how do we, manage pain and and is the pain physical is it emotional is it you know existential spiritual pain because a lot of people you know hurt maybe at the end of life because they're they're grieving something or they're they have regrets other people there's physical pain depending on what their body is going through and so typically pain physical pain is managed through medication at end of life. Although there are things like I had a woman recently who um, she had uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. She never got any treatment and she only she only used acupuncture the whole time. And then at the very end, some CBD gummies and that was it and the odd aspirin. But like, um, you know, so there's holistic ways as well. Reiki, um, 
And but typically this is where hospice are really useful at the end because they will their job is to really dial in the pain management with medication at end of life, if that's what somebody wants. And I mentioned that other gentleman I worked with who he just wanted to experience it all. So yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and then you had mentioned the Go Wish card game. Uh, I know also to let people know that slide that you had up there with all the resources, we are going to be emailing that to everybody. So I wanted to to um, to let everyone know about that. But you want to just um, mention that again, like how does that Go, card, Go Wish card game work? Um, yeah, sure. So it's a set of cards basically that has... Uh, you know, there's a wish on every single card and it can be anything from my wish is to be free of pain or um, to have a doctor that understands me, to have loved ones around me, to have music. You know, there's it's it's a full range of wishes or to be able to pray. Um, it covers a lot of different aspects. So you lay them all out and then you form three columns with your cards, starting with what's very, very important to me, what's somewhat important to me. Um, what's you know not that important to me and then um the point is to try and get whittle down your really important list to maybe your top 10 or top five so that you get really really clear as you work through that and moving someone to the somewhat important okay these are my non-negotiables this is what I really really want and so it's just a way to learn about each other as well especially if you play with family or you know you know, in a, a way to communicate as well, because people may not know what's important to you. So, yeah, I, really I love that. that. Yeah, I love that you can kind of play it together, and it doesn't put any one person on the spot. Like everybody can kind of just say, "This, let's, let's just all do this." Right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, and then another question around um, how to help someone manage overwhelming fear. Yeah, probably about about death. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We were talking about this at a meeting this morning and I think, and fear can be so overwhelming, it's such a powerful emotion, you know? Um, and I think the, I think that the initially it's to really explore and get to understand that person of like, what is the fear? Where is it coming from? You know, is it about suffering? Is it about being alone? Is it about just the big unknown? You know, what is what is the fear really about? And sometimes people find it hard to express what their fear is about. But um, a lot of the time, it's maybe they just, you know, have not been around death very much, don't understand what's ahead of them, um, or or just the resistance to I don't. I don't want to die. I don't, I'm not ready, you know? So the first step really is in bringing understanding and compassion to that person and trying to get to know them and get to know, you know, what's going on for them. And, and like, like I mentioned that lady who had a, a young boy and, and her fear was leaving him, you know, it wasn't really about her. So I think, um, even just that, you know, as doulas, one of the things we do the most is just deep, active listening. It's like often there's not much, there's not always a lot to do, but just being present and really deeply listening to someone and and that that power of just human presence, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and just trying to bring some understanding. So that's where I would start, but without knowing what the fear is, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. hard to you know, hard to address, but uh, that would be the first step for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I know you also mentioned um, just, you know, like some of the fear can be about like unfinished business, right? I, I'm not ready because there, there's still things I need to do or things I need to say, so, um, or things I need to understand. Yeah, regrets, like dying before your time. Uh, oh, I haven't done everything I wanted to do, or mm -hmm. this is not how I imagined it, it would be. Yeah, 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 okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. Okay, and so another question is about really when we did the practice of connecting to the heart and just yes. kind of understanding that how how do we really connect to the heart other than just kind of placing our hand on it? Kind of how do we how do we do that more mm -hmm. internally? Yeah, that's a great great question, and and really it's a practice, right? Because we're so used to being in our minds, and so there's various tools like heart meditations. Um, 
kind of just bringing awareness as well that, you know, when you're speaking or you're responding or making decisions, it's like a checking in with yourself. Is this coming from my heart or is this coming from a place of this is what I think I should say or do or society expects me to say or do, you know? And so it's so easy for us to go there and to, for our own hearts and voices to get lost. So that can be one way. Um, yeah, things like, I mean, I'm a Reiki practitioner, so I love that kind of, I love Reiki healing, um, different kind of body work, just tuning into more of the body and, and just practicing as well, connecting with people heart to heart in very open ways. So if it's hard for you to like express your feelings and um, then having a little go at practicing that like trying it on you know just in little ways like mm -hmm. um and that's how we connect with each other is 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 being true and being real and being honest and um so many of us have we all do we have our personas and we have our barriers and we have you know boundaries and protections and it's like yeah. it, it can feel very vulnerable to 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 connect from the heart like that so yeah yeah I'm curious it's, like, very, it's very like authentic you're just kind of connecting yeah. to part of you that is just you that's just real and could be raw and vulnerable exactly and then I would say just what brings you joy and love and like is it being out in nature and doing more in that of that or mm -hmm. you know um music what actually makes your heart sing and <laughs> doing more of those things yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then one other question uh, that I had actually was, um, have you had any experiences with people who have um, decided to do the end of life act and, and any kind of, you know, um, has it, has it, does it make it easier or difficult for families in your experience to have that yeah. planned, you know, like a plan? Um, yeah, no, that's, I do, I have worked with um, some people who've chosen to enact end of life options act. So medical aid and dying is uh, the term. And, you know, again, it looks a little bit different for everyone. And I did just recently have one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. I was the same lady who didn't take any pain medication the whole way through <laughs> her cancer journey, but then she decided she wanted a little bit of control around um, her end of life. And it wasn't a choice between, you know, it's not a choice between living and dying. She was dying anyway and could really feel her life force leaving. And so anyway, she picked her her date and her and her two daughters were there um, holding her in the bed, you know, as as she as she passed away after she took the concoction. Um, I was also there with the hospice nurse and social worker and so you take anti-nausea medication an hour before you ingest the final medication. And before we gave that to her, we did a group Reiki session on the bed, you know, so there was like six women on the bed all doing Reiki. And, and then um, in that situation, it was a beautiful experience for the family and they were very prepared. And, and for us as practitioners, we sat below them in this split level and, and the three of us meditated, sending up good energy that's what they wanted to the three women on the bed, the mother and two daughters. And so in that way, everyone had been planning this for a long time. They knew what was coming. They, they, um, it felt easier for them, you know, and I can think of another case where uh, a woman that I worked with, her best friend and her son and daughter-in-law were very supportive, but she had a lot of friends who really were not. And that was hard for them and there was a zoom memorial it was during COVID, so there was a zoom memorial before she ingested and i actually got on the, the zoom uh, one part in the process and um, just to speak to everyone there and and fill them in on what was was happening and how that it was you know it was peaceful and everything and the kind of looks of like shock and you know everything coming back was was stark and i knew i was speaking to some people who were not supportive, but they wanted to show up anyway, or they didn't understand her wishes. And so that can be hard, you know, she was very clear and her dearest were supportive. Um, so I just think it's, it's again, a very 
all these cases are individual and yeah. and yeah sometimes we do have to work with people who don't understand our wishes you know yeah. and so as best as possible you know we're trying to be advocates for for our client but then we also have to consider everybody around as well yes okay Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that is all the questions that I see. Um, I appreciate all of you being here. Um, Anthea, I want to take a moment just to thank you so much for really helping us bridge this topic in such a caring, loving, safe way. And I, I know that we're all going to get a chance to experience more uh, with you after the show. Um, for those of you who that who are leaving us now, I really want to thank you for your courage and in, in being here with us and exploring this topic together.